Hello, Riverside Online. It is good to be with you today. Wherever you find yourself, I just want to let you know here in Fort Myers, the weather is starting to cool off. It's only going to be 90 degrees today, but the humidity really has dropped the last few days and we miss you. We hope to see you someday soon. Will you pray with me? Father, thank you for time to open your word together, to step into it and to hear from you. And we just ask that you'd remove the distractions wherever we find ourselves right now. And, and let us just learn from your word as your spirit guides us and teaches us. And thank you for Jesus who has saved us. In his name, amen. My friends bought a used mattress from Craigslist. Now, many of us would hesitate at that combination of words, used mattress and Craigslist, but their expectations were really high and they wanted a bargain. It's difficult to convey the loss of hope they describe when they arrived in the driveway and walked to the door of the mobile home. I suppose they anticipated a hairless, odorless, and freshly showered man like Mr. Clean. Instead, the way they tell it, was a sweaty, chain-smoking Chewbacca welcomed them into the stale and musty air of his burrow. Seeing no way to refuse the gift of his bed now, they paid him quietly and loaded the perspiration-stained sleeping pad into their van. The aroma of regret filled their vehicle. The scent of regret along with disappointment and wet wookie. And as they pulled away in silence and shock, my friend looked at his wife and said, you want to take it straight to the dump? As she replied with a simple yes. And they drove to the landfill and paid to unburden the musky mattress they had just driven across the county to purchase. If you ever experienced a moment where your expectations and reality collided, the disappointment ever been so great that you would pay money to undo it, that gap, the gap between expectation and reality, we call that disappointment. And sometimes we cope with disappointment by just lowering our expectations or trying to have no expectations, but that's really difficult to do. Expectations creep in. As an American, I expect to be treated a certain way. As a man, a working man, I expect to be treated a certain way. As a white man, those expectations are the source of much disappointment and sometimes even anger. And when I examine my own expectations, I find that many of them come from pride and maybe even sin, nestled into a deep place where I think I deserve to be treated a certain way. And when that doesn't happen, I wonder what went wrong. Instead of questioning the expectation, I question, well, who must have not understood what I was expecting? The Bible teaches me that God loves me. It teaches me that every good and perfect gift is from Him, but it never teaches me to expect to be treated a certain way by people. It never treat, teaches me to assume that I am special or noteworthy or even worthy. Blessed? Yes. Loved? Yep. But worthy? No. Jesus is worthy. I get in through His grace his worthiness. We were children of the curse. The gospel is that while we were sinners, he died for us. We're not worthy, but we are wanted, wanted by God, wanted by Jesus. So if that's true, if the earth is cursed, but God is good, if we were doomed, but Jesus saved, saves, then what should we expect? What should be a correct expectation? Because if you can answer that and you correct your expectations, you can shrink that gap between expectation and reality and you cut down on disappointment, you can begin to walk in more joy and confidence. So get a Bible, turn it, open it, turn it on to 1 Peter. 
We're going to be in the first chapter, the first couple of verses. You can go to the very end and scroll back and you'll find it pretty quickly. There's a series of books that start with numbers, a series of letters written uh, that are included in Scripture. And last week we set up part of the problem that we're going to be walking through as we go through this book. We live between two worlds, the now and the not yet. We're redeemed, but we're still afflicted. We're forgiven and yet we still sin. We've crossed over from death to life, but we still live here with death. Now, I think that by itself helps with expectations. where We can say, God, I've turned to you, but I'm still struggling. Or, God, you say you've made me holy, but have you seen the stuff I think about? Well, duh. That's because we're in the in-between. The debt of sin has been paid, but the ledger has not yet been closed. If we look at this passage in Peter, he's going to tell us first who we are, who you are. And he's going to tell us where you are, why, how, and for what. And then, finally at the end, what to expect. All of that is going to be connected. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father and the sanctification of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with His blood, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. Now, you may not have caught all six of the adverbs that I told you it's going to answer, but back at verse 1, before he tells us who you are, he tells us who he is. Peter, Simon, Simon Peter, or Cephas. We spent last week here just on him, figuring out who the guy is God's using to write this to us. And I encourage you to go watch or listen to that. Jesus changed his name. And Peter embraced the name that Jesus gave him. And Peter was given a task. He is an apostle. In Greek, that word is apostolos. It means messenger. He was one who was sent out by Jesus. Now, I believe there were only a few of these. There were 11 when you get the 12 disciples and, and Judas kind of taken out. But then Matthias, James, Paul, and Barnabas are all named as apostles in your Bible. Maybe then Silas... Andronicus and Junius. People argue about those last three. That's 18. We think that's it. They saw the risen Jesus. They saw him resurrected and they were appointed by him. They work like almost Old Testament prophets. They reveal much of the word to us. They, many of them were the scripture writers. That's not the same thing as a church leader or somebody who pioneers ministry in a thing or even our early church fathers or important leaders in the church. Uh, Ignatius, years ago, wrote, I do not enjoin you as Peter and Paul did. They were apostles. I am a convict. It's a different kind of thing. And the reason I point that out is when you run into people who claim to be apostles now, they ain't. They may be some other kind of thing, but it's not like what these were. Peter writes to us with authority. And just to be clear, the authority came from a very specific place. It's Jesus Christ or Jesus the Messiah. Christ is the Greek for Messiah. It's not Jesus the gifted or Jesus the great. It's Jesus the Messiah, the anointed one, the chosen one. So we have confidence in what comes next. And what comes next is going to tell you who you are. You are elect exiles. That's an interesting combination of two words. Electos means selected or chosen or favorite. I can't soften that word. God reveals himself as he is. Those who are in Christ are favored. You found favor. The second word, parapitamos in Greek, the exile word, it's a word that can be translated pilgrim or refugee. Some of your Bibles may say alien. You are the chosen or favorite refugees. Now think about that. I don't know if anybody told you that or not. God's chosen are refugees, aliens. This world is not home. That's why it feels like it does. You were made for paradise. 
But the first humans, when given a choice between God and sin, they chose sin and it brought death. And in mercy, God locked us out of paradise and made sure we didn't take from the tree of life and live forever. You go read that in the first part of Genesis. We couldn't live forever until all sin could be atoned for. We would have to wait for the right moment for Jesus. And in the very end of your Bible, when everything is done and there's a new heaven and a new earth, a new paradise, it will be better than the first one that we ruined. The Apostle John in the book of Revelation, end of your Bible, chapter 22, verse 1, Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, through the middle of the street of the city, also on either side of the river, the tree of life with its twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and His servants will worship Him. It's a new paradise. No tree of knowledge of sin or knowledge of good and evil, but two trees of life, like the one we weren't allowed to eat from back in Eden after sin. Two trees, one on each side of the river, which represents abundance. You'll be able to eat from it in abundance. We live forever there and there's no longer any curse. Sometimes here, it feels like all of life is groaning for that new earth. That paradise we await where there's no more pain, no more death. No more sorrow, no cancer, addiction, depression, illness, racism, injustice, no grief, no oppression, no discrimination, no heartbreak, no breakups, no disorders, syndromes, or dementia. This is not home. You in Christ have found the favor of God, but you do not fit here. You're exiles, strangers, aliens, refugees, I met a refugee in Austria last year, we became friends. He actually texted me this on, or texted me on Wednesday as I was writing this message. His family, when he was young, walked from Afghanistan to Iran to escape war. And then later on his own, he fled to Turkey and then to Greece and then to Macedonia and Slovakia and I think some other country I forgot to write down and then finally into Austria. He almost died a couple of times. He just wanted a home. He just wanted a home, a country that would let him stay. Now he's been in Austria since 2015. He still has no visa, but he found Christ in Austria. So, matter, so no matter what may come, war, hunger, exile, now he has a home, a family in Christ. We are elect exiles. You are an elect exile. You are not home here. Rather, because you found the favor of God through Jesus, you're on mission here. This is your assignment until He takes you home. You're between two worlds, right? You live in this one, but you're not of it. Exiles. Exiles of the dispersion. The Greek word there is diaspora. It's a word you may have heard of before. The Jewish people way back in around 587 BC had by then their northern kingdom had been scattered and fell basically into Assyria and then later the southern kingdom fell. The Bible says the glory left the temple and they were taken into Babylon and driven out of their land. That word is used to describe people who live outside their homeland, those who are part of a diaspora, a spreading, a scattering. Here, Peter is reapplying it now to Christians. These are names that you may hear the weatherman stumble over now and then. It's basically this little part of the world up in to Asia Minor and Turkey, uh, just north of Israel, up into all the way western Turkey. They're scattered, they're homeless, and they're God's elect. They're chosen. How did they get scattered? Well, they were scattered. Uh, persecution had come to the early Christians, especially around uh, those in Jerusalem, and they were driven out by oppression. There was hardship, and they needed to leave. People facing hardship did scatter, but 
the truth is we were kind of always scattered. They, they don't fit. We don't fit. Christians never really fit. Read your whole Bible. Normal life is humans who live like animals and do what they wish and have sex with whatever they want and they have no rules and the conscience is seared. Chosen means you begin to submit your will to your maker. You marry first. You turn the other cheek. You love your enemy. You put others before yourself. That's not normal. We've always been homeless, aliens, because this is not home. How did you get scattered or dispersed? Some may speak of the African diaspora. Many were taken from their homeland and sold into slavery in the Caribbean or in North or South America. Some were here in the U.S. and they were dispersed north and west by settlers who wanted their land or who found gold. Some Asians were brought here in the U.S. to build the railroad and then shipped back and some were left behind. Some Asians were taken in World War II and put in camps. Some people were taken in Europe in World War II and driven out of their land. Others immigrated here to escape war or famine or hunger or persecution. Some came for a new start. Some retired to sunny Florida. The issue for Peter is not how they got there or how we got here. Peter begins with people who are already dispersed. They're scattered. They're wanderers, refugees. Then he ties us together. He gives us identity with the home that lies before us. We start scattered. We're, our, we're on our way home. So where are you, Christian? You're on your way home. We're in between. We're on our way there. What were you expecting? Do you expect that all the pain and suffering and hardship and loss and worry and fear and longing would all be resolved through goodwill and science and maybe some new laws? Well, bless your heart. Like Gonzo on his epic adventure, captured in one of the best Journey of Discovery movies of all time, Muppets from Space, the only way to reconcile what we've been experiencing is to discover that this is not your home. We're aliens, strangers, exiles. This is temporary. That's who we are, that's where we are. And that was a great comfort to a set of Christians who were struggling as Peter is writing to them. I hope it's a comfort to you too. Now there's a reason why they didn't fit and why we find ourselves homeless according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. God the Father did it to you. <laughs> Elect and exiles according to, or kata, which means by, uh, according to. The Father did it. You are chosen and exiled because of the Father. The very act of God choosing or favoring you put you at odds with the world. It placed you in between, in it, but no longer of it. Foreknowledge. That's a complicated word. Uh, in Greek, it's prognosis. It's literally where we get English, prognosis. It means foreknowledge, to know beforehand, to forecast or know what's going to happen. Here, it refers to the advanced knowledge of God, His ability to see ahead, to know. Now, that's not the same as for determined. It's for knowing. Careful not to put your study of theology ahead of what the Bible says. And be careful uh, in thinking that you must understand it all in order to believe it. We worship God not because He's simple. And Peter doesn't explain what all that means, so I'm not going to either. I do know that whatever it means, it does not mean that God looked ahead in your life and realized you would deserve His mercy and grace. Whatever favor we get, whatever favor you get, it is unmerited. It means you don't earn it or deserve it. And somehow, not only with Him giving me choices that matter and me being responsible for my actions, but also with God initiating the grace that would irresistibly draw me to Jesus, the Creator who exists outside time, intervened in time on my behalf, on your behalf, and gave you favor. He chose you. And the Father's choice puts you at odds with the world. But it gives us identity. 
according to his great mercy, he has rescued you. And you, who now begin to see clearly, like one awakening from the matrix, you no longer fit in. Be secure in that. You are in his plan. Now, how did he do that? How did he take you who were unworthy and make you acceptable? He did it in the sanctification of the Spirit. In, in Greek, is in. I mean, it really is. E-N or um, epsilon nu. Epsilon something. It's, I don't remember. In. It, it means through. You're chosen by the Father in or through the Spirit. But not just in or through the Spirit. In the sanctification of the Spirit. The big word, and it has a small root, hagios. But here it's hagiosmos. It's the word for holy. A person or thing can be holy, set apart, or consecrated for a purpose. Uh, when you add the moss to it, it describes the process as it happens. The Spirit makes you holy. He sets you apart. Hagias moss. It's the set aparting or holy making. I like to say it that way because it helps keep these words clear in my head. In the holy making work of the Spirit, chosen by the Father, through the holy making work of the Spirit. I didn't make that up. You who are exiles are elect. You've been chosen by the Father to be set apart in the Spirit. Did you know that? The Spirit works to set you apart, to make you holy, to make you for God's purposes. When your expectations are collapsing or you're disappointed or life is more difficult than you expected, remember this, you were chosen to be set apart in the Holy Spirit. You are the temple of God, the home, the dwelling of the Holy Spirit. No wonder it's hard here. The world hated the light, hated Jesus, rejected it. And you carry the light around inside you. You don't fit in. And that is the Father's will. Why would he do that? Why would he take people who he loves and set them apart? We well, did it for this reason, for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with his blood. This word um, for is ice. It's to or into or toward. It shows purpose. It's telic. It's your purpose is that you've been set apart in order to be for obedience and sprinkling. This is the reason that you were set apart. Obedience and sprinkling are two ideas tied together into one idea, a single idea from two words. In English, we might say good and loud or nice and warm, and we're referring to one idea. They call that a, a hindiatus, I think. Um, Karen Jobes likes to point this out in her excellent commentary on 1 Peter, if you want to go a little deeper. The literal Greek here reads, for obedience and sprinkling blood, of Jesus Christ. They're conveying one idea. You're chosen by the Father to be set apart in the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ and sprinkling in His blood. That is why it is difficult. You have a purpose. You're elect, secure in the Trinity, Father, Son, Spirit, and your exiles set apart to obey Jesus and be sprinkled by his blood. One of my favorite bands used to sing of their desire for this. One of the lyrics went, let mercy come and wash away what I've done. I used to pray for him, the lead singer. I wish I had written him a letter to tell him that. He died in 2017. This thing he wanted, like a refugee seeking a home, it's possible. It's been offered. And you who are in Christ, you have it, sprinkled, washed by his blood. This life he calls us to, it's not easy. Turning the other cheek, loving enemies, forgiving, taking the log from your own eye, that's not natural. But now you are custom made for it. Who are you? You are elect exiles. Where are you? You're on your way home. Why? Well, it's according to the foreknowledge of the Father. He wanted it. How? Through the holy making work of the Spirit. And for what purpose? For obedience and sprinkling. You've been remade for this purpose. New creation, new identity, new person in a new covenant. Peter's referencing the old covenant. 
that was revealed through Moses back in an early book in your Bible, in the book of Exodus in chapter 24. Uh, then he, who was Moses, took the book of the covenant and read it in the hearing of all the people, or of the people. And they said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do and we will be obedient. They're a little naive and optimistic, but God has chosen them and made a covenant or a contract, a promise that will be sealed with blood. And Moses took the blood and threw it on the people and said, behold, the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. He sealed the covenant by sprinkling the blood of the sacrifice onto them. Peter's referring to this moment. But now for these Christians, for us, we've been sealed into a new covenant, obedience and sprinkling. But not just with the blood of bulls, now with the blood of Jesus. And not for obedience on your own, you have the Holy Spirit. You are the new people of God. Sure, it can be hard here. You don't belong here, but it is who you are. Jesus is what you are for. And you're not alone. You've been chosen by the Father through the holy making work of the Holy Spirit who now lives in you. You're not called to obey a list of rules. You're made to obey Jesus and He now lives in you through the Spirit. You obey the Holy Spirit as He guides you as He helps you understand the will of God through the Bible, as He helps you pray, as He convicts you of sin. This is you. This is your mission if you choose to accept it. And that's the whole of the Trinity, by the way, chosen by the Father, set apart through the Spirit for this covenant in the Son. So Jesus is either God or Peter's teaching idolatry, and He's not teaching idolatry. Chosen by the Father, set apart through the Spirit, for this covenant in the Son. I don't know what you were expecting, but that's pretty good. So, now that you know this, now that your identity's clear, what should you expect? Well, here's what you can hope for. Here's Peter's prayer. May grace and peace be multiplied to you. Grace is charis, and peace is reine. Grace is why he chose you. Peace is the fruit of spir the Spirit in you. Let them be multiplied to you in abundance, all you can eat in toto. You are His. Expect exile. Expect to not fit. Pandemics, disease, unemployment, confusion, grief, difficult decisions, maybe even isolation or injury. This place is cursed. Expect exile and to not fit. And then expect grace. Expect peace in abundance. You did not foolishly buy a used and stinking mattress on Craigslist. This was no mistake. This is who you are and what you are for. You've been given a clear identity amid scattered realities. You were chosen by God the Father to be made holy through the Spirit and to belong to the Son forever. What else matters? Bring it on, right? Will you pray with me? Father, I thank you that you show us our identity through this man, Peter, whose life we get to see grow and change right in front of our eyes in your scripture. And God, I pray that you would continue to remind us of this often as we work through this letter, that this work has been done so that we might belong to Christ. And that is our purpose in Jesus' name. Amen. I'll see you soon.